Uh, the last speaker for this session is uh, Blake Holman, and he's going to tell us about uh, parallel reversible pebbling, uh, quantum circuits with low amortized uh, space-time complexity. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Blake, and I'm going to introduce the parallel reversible pebbling game, and then I'll show you how to use the game to construct quantum circuits that are efficient for a variety of problems. So we're interested in time-space trade-offs. When you're designing an algorithm to say compute a function, oftentimes there are many ways to manage your space and time resources. You could have one algorithm that when we look at the space usage over time, it uses relatively a large amount of space, but it gets done with the computation relatively quickly. You could also design an algorithm that's space bounded at the cost of a longer runtime. On one hand, qubits are expensive, so it's advantageous to be space efficient. On the other hand, we could be too extreme in our um, attempt to save space. And even if the problem is still computable, the runtime could be too long so that it's infeasible. It also um, can lead to more decoherence. And that's why we are studying amortized space-time complexity, which quantifies how good of a trade-off our algorithm does. In particular, amortized space-time complexity measures the total amount of space used across all of the time steps. Equivalently, it's the average space usage times the runtime. So if we have an algorithm for some function f, and we examine the graph of space usage over time, amortized space-time complexity is just the area under the curve. So we're actually interested in a harder problem, which is coherently evaluating functions, that is, evaluating them in superposition. And this is a common task that we need to do, because for a lot of the cool quantum advantages we want to use, we usually assume black box access to some function. In reality, though, we have to implement those oracles. And it can actually be much more difficult to design an efficient, coherent quantum circuit for evaluating the function than it is to, um, say, design a classical algorithm to design it to evaluate it classically. And this is in part due to the reversibility of quantum computation. So how do we usually get around this? Well, the standard technique is to start with an efficient classical algorithm for computing the function f. And then we design a reversible classical algorithm by replacing every irreversible operation with an equivalent reversible one, essentially keeping around all the information that uh, we would have deleted. And this does work. Um, in fact, it actually maintains the time complexity of the original algorithm. The problem is that it blows up our space usage and thus our amortized space-time complexity. And so in this work, um, our main result is that we introduce this thing called a parallel reversible pebbling, and then we use it to map irreversible algorithms to reversible ones while maintaining the amortized space-time complexity except for a small multiplicative overhead. So let's give an example on why the standard technique can fail. Here, we're interested in iterative functions. So we have some function h, and we want to compute h to the n of x, where h to the n is just h composed on itself in times. Designing a classical algorithm that's efficient is pretty easy, because we can just compute the function in place. So we have x. We can compute h of x. And then with h of x, we can compute h of h of x, and so on, until we're done. But something changes when we want to design our quantum circuit for the problem. In particular, we can't just compute the, compute the function in place, because that is not reversible. So usually what we do is we will XOR um, the value of h into a new register. So we have h of x. But now we're left with the same problem, and we have to do it again. So we have h2 of x. And now we're already using more space than the classical algorithm. 
uh, but we can go ahead and finish. And then when we're done, uh, because we want this circuit to be coherent, uh, we need to uncompute the intermediate values. Okay, so this takes some more queries, uh, but it's a standard technique and uh, eventually we, we can do it. But there's a clear problem in that the, um, for the classical algorithm, we had amortized space-time complexity equal to n because the time complexity is linear and the space complexity is constant. But for our quantum algorithm, we see that uh, we have amortized, we have quadratic amortized space-time complexity because both our space usage and our time were there. And so we looked at this example and saw that the standard technique fails to preserve this complexity metric. In particular, if we're not careful, um, our reversible algorithm can have much higher amortized space-time complexity than the original. So the question we might ask is whether or not, um, you know, these iterative functions are some special case that we don't really need to worry about, or are they representative of typical problems? And so I'm gonna claim that um, they are representative of typical problems. That's because the standard way of mapping irreversible algorithms to reversible ones essentially treats um, each irreversible algorithm as an iterative function. So we can kind of map out this line graph that represents the runtime of the irreversible algorithm CF, and each node represents the state of the algorithm at that time step. So at time i, the, the, fun the algorithm transitions to state two. State two takes as input the previous state of the algorithm and then outputs state three and so on until we get to the end where the output is the function. So this is an important problem and it has been studied for a while. In the 80s, Bennett introduced the reversible pebbling game um, and he shows how to convert irreversible algorithms to reversible ones. The idea is that we generate what's called a reversible pebbling of the line graph. And then using that pebbling, we can actually create our classical reversible algorithm for the problem. And then we know that, um, you know, taking the reversible algorithm and generating the quantum circuit is straightforward. So Bennett's pebbling is nice because it preserves space-time complexity, which is the maximum space usage times the time. Not yet. So <laughs> soon we will learn how to reversibly pebble. Um, so Bennett's technique fails to preserve the metric we're interested in, which is the much stronger amortized space-time complexity. And remember, that's just the average space times the time, which is usually a lot different than the maximum space times the time. It also fail, um, space-time complexity also fails to capture the cost of parallel algorithms, which is important for um, proving the security of certain cryptographic primitives, as well as for limiting decoherence. So what is the real difference between these two? Um, well, if we have an al algorithm, we know the space-time complexity is the time multiplied by the maximum space usage, which is like the bounding box of our plots of space over time. The problem is that it doesn't work well for parallel algorithms because it doesn't scale. In particular, if I have an algorithm that has high space-time complexity, but the maximum space usage is only used for a short amount of time, I can do something like stagger the start times of um, our algorithms and then compute the function many times in parallel with a space-time cost that is um, essentially like computing at once. Therefore, it's not very descriptive. And if you try to set up your system based on uh, your space-time complexity, you could be vastly underutilizing your resources. With amortized space-time complexity, time multiplied by the average space usage, we see that it's the area under the curve. And so the amortized space-time complexity of computing a function three times 
is three times the amortized space-time complexity of computing at once. So the good thing, though, is that we can still analyze amortized space-time complexity with this tool called the pebbling games. OK, so what's the reversible pebbling game? Well, in this setup, uh, we have some DAG. In this case, it's a line graph, which represents our iterative function like before. Each node has a label. In this case, the label for node v is just h to the v. And the last label, the label of the last node in the graph corresponds to the output of the function. In this game, we have a set of pebbles, and each pebble represents a chunk of memory. In this way, placing a pebble um, on a node corresponds to computing the label and storing it. Removing a pebble corresponds to unallocating that memory so I can use it elsewhere. And in our parallel version of the game, um, the only difference is that you can place and remove many pebbles at once. OK, so let's go through a little example. Um, the exact rules of the pebbling game um, are that at the beginning, so you can always place a pebble on a node whose parents already have pebbles on them. So right here, we can pebble the first node. You can't remove a pebble if it was just used to produce another. That's because you needed that information to <clears throat> generate new information. So you can, at the same time, you cannot undo it. Lastly, we can only remove a pebble from a node if all of its parents have pebbles on them. So this makes sense because if we're trying to uncompute something, then we have to re-query the information in order to um, remove uh, that label. OK, so let's go through our old example. Um, first, we computed um, h of x. And so that's going to be like placing a pebble on node 1. Using h of x, we can place a pebble on node 2. So because we have node 1 pebbled, we can place a pebble on node 2, and so on, until we've finished the computation. So placing a pebble on that last node corresponded to evaluating the function. And then we have to uncompute, which corresponds to removing these pebbles, which we can do simply, and we're done. So that's a reversible pebbling. OK, great. So let's um, go through our results. Um, so first, we're going to go through our new parallel reversible line graph pebbling. Then we're going to use that reversible line graph pebbling to generate a transformation from irreversible algorithms to reversible ones while maintaining the amortized space-time complexity. And then we're going to show how we can apply it to um, generate attacks for a cryptographic primitive called memory hard functions. OK, so to do our line graph pebbling, we just generalize the um, original reversible line graph pebbling of Binet. Um, so what we did is we optimized some implicit parameters, and then we parallelized it. So how does it do? Um, well, the time complexity of the naive strategy was linear. Bennett's pebbling is slightly more than linear, but we show that by parallelizing it, we can get it uh, back to linear. This corresponds to uh, being able to simulate the irreversible algorithms while maintaining the time complexity. And so our space, um, we improve a lot on the space complexity. Before it was linear space, and now the space usage is subpolynomial. And um, we're in our parallel algorithm, we actually use a little bit more space um, to get our time advantage. So in the end, the amortized space-time complexity is the same for both of them. But you see how we improve from quadratic amortized space-time complexity down to almost linear. We also give a lower bound, so you can't really do much better than this. OK, so we have a nice linear um, pebbling that has low amortized space-time complexity. Well, what can we do with it? So on its own, this pebbling does not preserve amortized space-time complexity. That's because each node has a different amount of space associated with it. So what we can do is take our line graph again for the runtime of C. 
And then we can assign weights to each node corresponding to the space usage at that time step. If we classify nodes as, say, light, medium, and heavy, in reality, there's a lot more than that. Then we can try to design a strategy that has low complexity given these weights. So the space usage at a step in our pebbling is just the sum of the weights of all of the nodes at that time step. What we do is we try to use our old strategy, um, the new parallel reversible line graph pebbling, but we only want to pebble the light nodes, say um, one, six, and eight, because you know if we keep pebbles on the heavy nodes, it's going to be expensive and it's going to blow up our amortized space-time complexity. Now, we can't just do that because indeed there are nodes in between. Placing a pebble on node six will be illegal, and so we're going to recursively fix all these um, illegal steps. And the point is that we want to keep pebbles on heavier nodes as for as little time as possible, and we can afford to do that because there are relatively few heavy nodes relative to the average um, average space usage of our algorithm. Okay. So let's go through a little example. Um, we want to pebble this graph. And so, like I said, we want to pebble only the light nodes, ideally. So we place a pebble on node one, but then we encounter a problem immediately. To pebble node six, we have to pebble this whole line graph in between it. So we're just going to call this pebbling strategy again recursively on this subline graph. OK, again, we just want to pebble the lightest nodes that we can. So we place a pebble on node two, but now there's another line graph in between. To place a pebble on node five, we then have to pebble nodes three and four and pebble node five. But nodes three and four are heavy, so we want to keep pebbles on them for as little time as possible. So we're going to go ahead and unpebble them. OK, now we can pebble node six. Uh, yeah, we have to remove the medium pebbles now, which means we have to repebble the heavy nodes and so on. OK. And then we're able to uh, clear off all of the previous pebbles. And so now we're not using so much space. To finish the pebbling, we just have to do one more recursive call, pebble seven, and we're done. So that's a high level overview um, on how we are able to get this transformation, where previously uh, we were not able to, to preserve amortized space time complexity, but this strategy does. Uh, in particular, um, we have this small overhead um, in our amortized space-time complexity, which is sublinear in the time complexity of the irreversible algorithm. Great. OK, so now we have this nice transformation. Um, the last thing is that we provide quantum attacks on memory hard functions. So memory hard functions um, are a cryptographic primitive used for storing passwords. Its security is brought by its high amortized space-time complexity. So the idea is that now we can port over all of the attacks that we've studied before, um, and now we can have efficient amortized space-time uh, complexity quantum circuits for the attacks, meaning we can employ pre-emit search um, and so on to defeat the primitive. Uh, one application of this is an attack on Argon2i, which was the password hashing comp competition winner in 2015. Uh, but we're able to, um, our results apply to pretty much all memory hard functions, and you can see the paper for details. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so in this work, we used this pebbling game to um, be able to construct these quantum circuits with good trade offs. Uh, from our original classical algorithms. So what's next? I think one of the more exciting um, future work for this is um, on memory hard functions. So classically, there's this nice result that says that we can always map a classical evaluation strategy to a pebbling, a cost equivalent pebbling. This means that pebbling is both an upper and lower bound on the amortized space-time complexity. The natural question is whether or not we can show that reversible pebblings also characterize the cost of 
coherently evaluating them. In particular, I, I think that memory hard functions are a promising candidate uh, for breaking through this barrier we seem to have on proving space-time lower bounds for single output functions. So if you have any questions or you wanna talk about anything space-time trade-off related, uh, you can email me. Also feel free to look at our papers. Um, the first one's on archive and the other's on preprint. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you for the talk. Um, so I was curious as to how this might compare to say like an active volume architecture. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Um, so it's essentially a setting. Uh, so this is a paper by like Daniel Latinsky and Naomi Nickinson that like considers um, essentially just the amount of gates, like the, just the gate volume being relevant to the total computation. And this is achieved through like gate teleportation um, so the, the question is, um, how worried are you as to whether or not having a bunch of qubits containing garbage sitting around are like actually going to be like a reason for like these computations being difficult to scale? I see. Um, so yeah, I, I am not aware of that. Uh, but as far as being worried about garbage and scaling it, um, so I, I think just in general, like, um, when you compute, especially like very sequential things, you're going to generate um, a lot of garbage. And for most applications, you can't keep that around because it will mess with the uh, coherence. So uh, yeah, it, maybe I don't completely understand the question, but um, I think that, you know, pebbling is a decent tool for uh, making sure you clean up the garbage in an efficient way. Thank you. More questions? Um, so uh, if I understood correctly, all this mechanism of pebbling is for implementing classical functions on, on quantum. Mm -hmm. so, um, so first of all, you you had this, uh, the examples that you studied here are, are like the taking powers of these, of these classics. Does it, but does it also work for more general functions or? Yeah, yeah. That, so the, tr the real thing is that it works for any problem where you have, um, where you can represent your data dependencies as a graph. And so it's true, you, you can just only use reversal pebblings for like a quantum problem where you are able to map that out. So yeah, it does work in general. That was just like the example I went, went for. Thank you. And can you, I mean, suppose I have a, qu a quantum function quantum, and, um, and maybe it uses resets in, uh, in the middle. Can I use some of these techniques there? Or? Yeah, so um, our, okay, our reversible pebbling game actually does not, um, yeah, it doesn't characterize these like possible like measuring and stuff like that. Um, I do think it's a very interesting question on how we can um, kind of represent that in the pebbling game. Now there's like another pebbling game called the spooky pebbling game that, <laughs> yeah, that, that uses um, like intermediate measurements to save some space. So it is an interesting open question whether or not we can combine those two ideas. Um, but as for now, I, um, only coherence. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? Okay, so let's, thanks to the speaker again. <laughs>